verse number one. But so it happened that when San, Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the walls, that he was furious. If your cousin was staying, stand with me. He was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he, stood, he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, beside him and said, whatever they build, even if the foxes go up on it, it will break down their walls. Here's Nehemiah's prayer. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproaches on their own heads and give them as a plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquities and do not let their sins be blotted out before them. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together half his height, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. I want to preach to you from this morning the subject, a mind to build. Let the church say that, a mind to build. Amen, you may be seated. A mind to build. I want to, um, I said, I want to preach a little bit, I want to teach a little bit, and then I want to testify a little bit. A mind to build. Uh, Dr. Sam Chan in the book, uh, Bigger and Faster, he displays to us the importance of the unity of people coming together. It is in that book, Bigger and Faster and Stronger, that he depicts the rebuilding of the Panama Canal, the building of the Panama Canal, and how people came together to build this this passageway that would take us into uh, South America called the Panama Canal and the importance of having unity together. Here in the book of Nehemiah, how many people are familiar with the story of Nehemiah? Uh, less than half, less than half. The story with the Nehemiah, it's, it's, it's a unique book. Nehemiah, first of all, um, when you look in Romans 12, when you look at the gift of administration, Nehemiah, in a sense, has made reference to that gift of administration. Administration is this is able to be able to see the finished product before you get started. So in a sense, he was a visionary. In a sense, he was able to, to see what was happening or what needed to happen and how to put the proper people in place for the success to be. Messiah, you're, you're in the place of rebuild. You're in the place of refresh. You're in the place of renewal. I want to challenge you today to follow the visionary of Pastor Rod and what he has in mind and the things that he wants to accomplish as these people did in the book of Nehemiah. All right? Keep, stay with me. Stay with me. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. For those who don't know what a cupbearer is, in those days, the king had what he called a cupbearer that sat beside him. So before he drank anything, Nehemiah would drink it. If there was any poison in it, Nehemiah would be dead. It's not a glorious job. I just need to let you know something. Uh, whatever food that the king was ate, eating, Nehemiah would cut the food up and he would partake of the food before the king partook of the food. And if there was any poison in it, Nehemiah would kill over. It's not, it's not a glorious job, but that was Nehemiah's responsibility. And so whoever was the cupbearer of the king held a position of prestige, held a position of power, and now Nehemiah is on the scene. Watch this. Let's turn this out. The Jewish people are in exile. That means that they're in slavery at this current moment. And word gets back to Nehemiah that Jerusalem, the city of David, has been burned. The walls have been burned. The gates have been turned down. Everything has been destroyed. And Nehemiah's heart was broken because the walls and the gates of the city were down. 
Now, it's significant that when your city does not have walls around it or your city does not have gates around it, what it's saying is that the city is weak and that the enemy can come in and do whatever they want. They can capture that land because the gates and the walls were not there. Nehemiah hears about this, and Nehemiah is heartbroken. When you want to put this whole story together, you got to read 2 Chronicles, the book of Ezra, and the book of Nehemiah, and they all blend together this story that I'm talking to you about this morning. 2 Chronicles, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. In 2 Chronicles, it depicts the rebuilding of the wall. In Ezra, it talks about Ezra is the priest, and now the priest was reading the word of God over the people while they did the work. That is why, watch this, in most churches, pulpits are elevated so that the pastor is up, that he can speak the word of God over you, and he can speak blessings over your life. I know y'all just learned something this morning. That's why the pulpit is elevated, so that he speaks the word over you, and the blessings now bestow on top of you. Nehemiah, I'm, I'm teaching this morning, the city is in ruins, there's nothing but rubbish, and also Jerusalem, the place of Jesus, the place of the Jews, the city of David, is now being ridiculed by the people on the outside. They're talking bad about it. They're saying something as simple as this. A, a, a man a, of a fox would run up on the walls of the city. You know how small a fox is. That guess what? The walls would fall down. The key in this text is what I want us to be mindful of is that you have builders and you have maintainers. Let me, let me say that again. You have builders and you have maintainers. Builders are able to build with no matter what the situation is. I, I'm a builder by trade. I'm a builder by trade. I got called off of Isaiah 58 and 12 where it says, you shall restore the old waste places. You shall restore the streets to dwell in. You shall take old ruins. In other words, what God said to me when he called me was that, guess what, Daryl? You'll be a trash man and you'll take somebody else's trash and you'll turn it into treasure. The two churches that I have passed in my time, guess what? I have taken them and I have rebuilt them. That's why I'm here this morning. I'm right here this morning because I know that you're in the process of renewal. You're in the process of refreshing. You're in the process of doing something. And I want to speak to you this morning because I want you to be clear about what I'm saying to you this morning, that Messiah, that God has placed you in this place. He is giving you this land, not just because you're cute, but he's giving you this land for a purpose. From the time that I've come here the first day to now watching the communities that are being built around you, watching the development that's taking place around you, God put you here for such a time as this because now you have an opportunity to have what we call residual income. Anybody know residual income? I like residual income. But if you're going to rebuild the kids' zone first, you're going to rebuild Messiah kids first, it's an opportunity that you now will now be able to minister to the future. Looking around the room, a lot of us in here have more sunsets and sunrises behind us than we do in front of us. Now we have an opportunity from my last message when I taught on the fruit about tithing that we now have Christian education where we have the mandate from God to religiously educate our children. Amen. Don't be like I was. I was a CME. Christmas, Mother Days, and Easter. Y'all will catch that a little bit later. That's the only time I went to church. Christmas, Mother Day, and what? And Easter. Your pastor is a builder. It's now time to get behind him and help him to what? Build. Because the people had a mind to. Some of y'all are with me. Some of y'all looking at me. That's all right. You have other people who are maintainers. If they're just maintainers, they just maintain it as status quo. They don't have any vision to see anything in the future. They just keep everything flowing. They keep everything afloat. Maintainers are okay when you need to maintain. But maintainers are not good when it's time to build. Because when it's time to build, the maintainer is unstable because he does not know how to live in the world of building because all he does is. Pastor Rod is a builder. First thing that we see in this text is in chapter number one. 
Chapter number one, I'm doing expository chapters for you. Chapter number one, the word gets back to Nehemiah. He gets back to Nehemiah that the city lies in ruin, that the things are in waste, the things are being devastated all around him. And that's my first point that I want to give you is there was a type of oppression that was on God's people. Messiah, we're, we're living now in a different age. Church as we used to do it is no longer be done the same way. It's this thing called COVID. That God shut down every religious service, whether it was Christian, Muslim, Jewish, whether it was Pentecostal, Baptist, whatever. It shut it down around the world. And now we're now trying to recover from something that we could not even see that changed our whole world. Oppression had taken place. The next thing that we see is in chapter 2 that there are some obstacles that are in it. Anytime that you're trying to do something significant for God, you will run into obstacles. Amen. Can, can, can I testify to you this morning? If you don't run into any obstacles, I need to let you know you need to check the direction that you're going. Because the devil don't mess with nobody that's doing his business. <laughs> Some of y'all will catch that a little bit later, what I just said. But if you got hell kicking off in your life, guess what? You're going in the direction that God wants you to go into, so you got to experience it. I need to let you know. Now I'm going to testify to you a little bit. My first church, we started. We started six people in a Super 8 motel. Help me, somebody. They left the light on for us. Six people in a Super 8 motel, but God began to do something. We, we began to grow. We began to move. Uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, our, our, our church size was probably the office that y'all had over in the front area. And we had like 60 people in there. We had to put baby oil on for you came in in the morning. We were just squeezing up in there, squeezing up. There. You, you couldn't even lift your hands in worship. All you had to do, you had to worship like this. You had to worship like this. Uh, so we were in there, we were in there tight, but we need to build it. And as I started to look for a place for us to go to, I ran into people in the community that would not rent to churches. Obstacle. I had a man say to me, I'd rather leave my building empty than rent to a church. Because he had been bent, bent, burned by so many churches before. That same man ended up renting to me a space. That same man that when I got done renting the space from him, watch what he said. He said, you changed my perception about what I feel about churches and what I think about God. I need to let you know that you're going to run into obstacles. Put this in your notes. Put this in your notes. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says this. The Apostle Paul says to me that a great and effective door has been opened to me, but there are many adversaries. I want to let you know this morning, Messiah, don't focus on the obstacles. Focus on the open door and the opportunities that are before you. Obstacles are designed to strengthen your faith. Obstacles are designed to help you. Obstacles are designed for you to use your faith. But if you focus on the obstacles, then you'll miss the open door. That's what happened to the children of Israel when they went into the promised land with David in there. I mean, with, with Joshua and Caleb. They focused on the giants, and they did not see the whole land. Joshua and Caleb saw the land that was flowing with milk and honey. The other ten saw the giants, and they could not get past the giants to see the land that was flowing that God had promised to them. Messiah, God has given you this community. God has promised you some things. Stop focusing on the obstacles. And thank God for the opportunities. All right, all right, all right. Chapter 3. Where are my brothers at? Fellas, stand up. Stand up, fellas. Let me put this on 33 to 3rd for you. Slow this down for you. Chapter 3 is unique out of the whole book of Nehemiah. Chapter, 30, chapter 3 in Nehemiah, it says, And the son of this, and the men of here, and the son of this, and the men of here, and the son of this, and the men of here. No women are mentioned in chapter 3. It is our responsibility as men to lead the way in this project of renewal, this project of refresh. No women were mentioned. It was only men. You may be seated. Let me testify to you a little bit. 
I'm at my next church, Day Spring Ministries, where I'm at currently. I come in. I take an evaluation of the sanctuary. Uh, it's 23 years old. The carpet has not been changed in 23 years, and it looks like it. Stains, spots everywhere. Uh, God lays on my heart to do a project refresh. I'm not on the job 90 days. We raise, listen to me, we raise $20,000 in six weeks. That's since we, we had men's fellowship that day. They showed up. Men's fellowship is we're going to pull up this carpet in the sanctuary. I'm going to feed you some sausages and some eggs and some potatoes after the fact. But you're going to work what? First. Because we had to have a mind to build. Within 45 minutes, 15,000 square feet of carpet was pulled up, rolled up, and put into the dumpster because we had a mind to build, because we were on one accord. I want to let you know, don't miss the importance of being on one accord. If you go to the book of Acts and you constantly see in the book of Acts alone that when people were on one accord, that God did miraculous things, that signs and wonders came after the people once they were on one accord. If we ever learn the principle of being of one mind, one heart, of one purpose, and watch and see what God does. Project Refresh got done. They looked at the sanctuary. We laid new carpet. We had the walls painted. We put some new lights in. And we saw, it's like, man, this is really, really nice. I said, I'm so glad that you love it. I said, guess what I, I want to do next? They said, what do you want to do that? I said, I want to do the North Axe in the cafe area. I want to put a hardwood like laminate in through that. I want to paint. I want to bring us up more modern. I need to let you know, guess what happened? I'm testifying to y'all now. We raised the money. Matter of fact, I've been there just a little bit over two years, and we raised $120,000, and every project we did was cash and carry. No debt acquired. But here's what I want to let you know. That's why I'm testifying to you this morning that God is no respect of person. If he can do it in Middletown, Pennsylvania at Dayspring, he can do it here at Messiah right here in Town. If the people put their mind together and have a what? A mind to build. Can we just talk a little bit this morning? Uh, uh, there's an opportunity that's before you for you now to start to impact the communities. Uh, there's a book called The Art of Neighboring, learning how to, to reconnect with our neighbors. One of the greatest tragedies that happened to us is when they put garages on our houses because we pull out of the Walk out of that kitchen into the garage or wherever your garage is. You back out of your driveway. You see your neighbors. You wave at them and you go by. But back in the day when they didn't have garages, guess what you had to do? You actually had to have a conversation with your neighbor. When's the last time I said, do you even know your neighbor's name? I want to challenge you here today. Learn your neighbors. Four houses down, four houses up four houses across and four houses behind you and get their name because that's gold for you right there to witness and to share your faith. Okay, okay. I told you we raised $120,000, cash and carry. All projects have been doing. We're now where y'all are. We're now about to do our kids area. And we realize that when we do the kids that we are now going to be ministering to our future. We're now raising the next pastors, the next deacons, the next elders, the next worship leaders of our church. So now we're focusing in on our kids' area. We're now going to rip out the air conditioning units that are over there that are barely working. We're now going to replace the carpet. We're now going to put fresh paint in. And we're doing all of this for the reason that we need to minister to next, to our children. And we are looking at opening up a daycare so that we could have residual income. I felt God right there. That, that, that's the trickle-down what? The trickle-down effects. 
What we take from this story in Nehemiah is this, is that there's going to be some oppression, there are going to be some obstacles, guess what? But also that there are some opportunities for us, for us to capitalize off of as a church. And then here's the next thing right here. Then there was an ovation that was at the end. Standing what? Ovation. Because now the project that they had to ridicule about, the project that they were joking with about, the project that they were tearing them down about, they rebuilt the whole wall for the city of Jerusalem in 52 days. 52 days. They rebuilt the wall. And all of those people that were ridiculed and all those people that were talking about them, they said this had to be nobody but God. Nehemiah 6.15, if you don't believe me, read Nehemiah 6.15. You go read that, that, that chapter right there. They rebuilt it in 52 days. It was a miracle inside of the eyes of everybody else. Messiah, I don't know about you, but I still believe in miracles. I still believe that God can heal. I still believe that God can deliver. I still believe that God will provide. I still believe that God will make a no out of way. Out of no way. Put this in your notes, Messiah. Isaiah 55, I mean, Isaiah 58 and 11. Isaiah 58 and 11 says this. Where God guides, he provides. Let me say that again. Where God guides, he what? He provides. That's why we were able to do all that we did, cash and carry. That's why we were able to raise the money. We did something as simple as this. Instead of you going to Starbucks, paying $5 a cup, really about six, seven days a week, $35. Two weeks, that's 70 for a month, that's 140. Here's what we challenge our families to do. Could you drop in an extra 100? Could you drop in 150? Some of you might be able to drop in 200. But we want to make sure that each month that the families did that in the church so they had some skin in the game. And guess what happened? $120,000 later, every project, every flooring, every paint, every decal, everything that had transpired was cash and carry. And Messiah, I'm believing God that he's going to do the same thing right here. He's no respecter person. <laughs> pastor God, what, what, what are you saying to us? Here's what I'm saying to you. It's not by accident that your pastor called me to come today. It's not by accident that you're in the middle of this rebuild process. God sent me by here today to testify to you, to let you see some flesh and some bones. Another church that has done it, and guess what? That the same thing that you're able to do, and guess what? You will do exceedingly and abundantly more than what we could ask or think if you trust him, Messiah, because as you're in this project, it's not for now, it's for our next. I can't wait to see how the kids' zone is going to be refreshed. I can't re wait to see how the classrooms that will be performed. I can't wait to see what you're going to put out in your land. We're looking at putting out a pavilion on our land also, putting, a, putting out a pavilion on our land. We're looking, doing 20 by 100 pavilion. Guess what? It's going to be large. It's going to be big. We're going to put outhouses, not outhouses, but uh, porta john. Porter John's out there. Put Porter John's out there. We're going to put Porter John's and electricity out there. We're going to have grills out there. But it's an opportunity for the community. If the community you want to rent, but it's also an opportunity for if our church members want to have a family reunion, they can have it right there on our land. I need to let you know that we've got 30 acres of land, and we got more land than what we know what to do with, but we're willing to start somewhere. And I want to testify to you this morning that we're watching you, and I want you to watch us, and then we're going to celebrate what God is doing down here, and I I want you to celebrate what God is doing up there. And what we will do is we'll sow a seed. We'll sow a seed. Because I ain't going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. Our church, Day Street Ministry, will sow a seed in the Messiah so that it can be what? In the fertile ground in which you are and that it will spring forth some back to us, some 30, some 60, and 100 fold. Watch this. But everybody in here has got to get on the same mind. It's a mind to build. And stop looking at your selfish stuff right now. All that coffee you're buying at Starbucks, all them donuts you're getting at Dunkin' Donuts, Panera Bread, uh, Chick-fil-A. I, I, know, I know that's Jesus chicken. That Jesus chicken good, too. I know that Jesus, that, that Jesus chicken be, be, be working. I, I, I have me a 12-piece right now. I ain't going to lie to you. Amen. 
That's Jesus' chicken. I know, I know, I know. I just cursed at some of y'all. That's not my Chick-fil-A. Oh. But I need to let you know, if you take those resources aside, guess what? Pack your turkey sandwich. Amen. Get you some crackers and stuff from home and take that excess and sow it into the kingdom of God and watch and see what God will do. And then when you got kids running around by you, knee high to the fly, and then you watch them grow up, and then you watch them graduate, and you watch them now have a place to worship, a place to call their own, guess what you will do? You'll thank God and you'll think about me that day, and then you'll realize you didn't eat that Jesus chicken after all. Stand with me. The people have to have a mind what? To build. We're not just doing it for, just to say we're doing it. We're not just doing it to say for our reputations. We're doing it because we're trying to minister to next. There are future doctors and lawyers that will come out of this church. There are pastors that are in this church. There are deacons that are in this church. Guess what? They're not even here yet, but once you make the space for them to come. I need to let you know, folks are looking for churches that have children and vibrant children ministries. And if you don't have that vibrant children ministry, guess what they'll do? They'll leave. Listen to me. Let me minister to you real quick. Probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. There's a prominent pastor in Texas. Y'all know him. Y'all see him on TV preaching all around the world, but he had a problem. His children's ministry wasn't doing it. So he found his church attendance was going down, and he started calling the people to see why they left, and he said, you don't have anything for the kids. A revelation came over him. He built something for the kids, and when he built the state-of-art facility for the kids, all of a sudden the revenue and the people started what? To come back. Y'all, if we don't minister to next we don't have anything else. The problem with most churches in America, watch this, watch this. The problem with most churches in America is that they're dying because they made no room for next because they're consumed with just what's happening right now. I want to challenge you today that your pastor is thinking about next. He's thinking about who the next pastors are going, who's going to be the next deacons, who's going to be the next elders. He's thinking about what is next and what next looks like Church, as we used to do it, y'all, we can't do it. Here's what we cannot be. We cannot be the eight-track church in the iPad world. I'm challenging you today that you may not feel comfortable with it, but do it. Sow that seed. Give up those resources. Amen. Get you some folders at home. Amen. I know your body might go over a little bit of withdrawal at first. Hey, get that Folgers at home. Amen. Just make the sound. Shh, while it's pouring in your cup. Pour the cream on it. Get your little froth. Up. But guess what? But if you take those resources and sow them into the kingdom, God will return to you a blessing pressed down, shaken together, and running over into your bosom. Let's pray.